These two new ways of thinking changed history. They were faith and reason. Faith meant all the objective truths that we can know by faith, and reason meant all the objective truths that we can know by reason. What is theology? Theology is the study of God. You're listening to Reason and Theology, where both faith and reason intersect. Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, joined by Eric Ibarra, Roman Catholic, and then also Canons Weaver and Father Canon Jair. So thank you so much, gentlemen, for being on. Thank you for allowing us to be here in your library and the rectory and also doing these uh, this interview. It's truly an honor to have you both. Well, Father Jair, let me start with you. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you become a priest and what made you interested in the traditional orders? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I would say my way was very ordinary. Mm. Um, my voc- I think I received my calling. I was twelve years old. Oh wow! Wow. Um, and um, I was an altar boy in France. I was also in a Catholic school. My godfather was a priest, mm-hmm. and I think that he's a soul. Uh, had a good yeah. impact in sure. my soul. Sure. Uh, he was a friend and a remote cousin of my parents. So um, I grew up um, Catholic. I was right. born Catholic. Um, and uh, step by step, you know, uh, it, was, it was not a sudden revelation. Sure, sure. It's step kind of by gradual. step, I understood that um, it was um, my vocation. So I was ordained in the Institute of Christ the King uh, in... Um, 1992 in our seminary in Guisciliano, Italy. And um, after two ministries in two different parishes in France, mm. in 2011, I was assigned here in Milwaukee. Okay. Um, so it was uh, the adventure of a French priest in the Polish church in America. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> So uh, it's a very uh, rich experience. I learn right. every day. Yeah. And um, so I would say, yes, you know, uh, the, the God's plan is uh, always uh, mysterious, a little mysterious and, and yeah. surprising <laughs> in a positive sense of the yeah. word. So um, I would say, uh, I am a, a parish priest mm. um, with the support of my community, the Institute mm. of Christ the King. It's um, it's a great adventure, and uh, Saint Stanislaus in Milwaukee yeah. uh, offers the possibility for a priest yeah. to be uh, involved in uh, uh, the ministry of the souls and also in the big project of the, the restoration right, of, yeah, this, I see a lot of, of this church. Yeah. Uh, so the church restoration is uh, a demanding project, but yeah. I often uh, tell people they are oh, oh, it's wonderful. I tell them yes, it's nice, but you know, the most important is the restoration of our souls. True. Sure. That, that, sure. that is sure. That sure. is a big challenge. Sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. That yeah. Is a big challenge. This will life. fade away, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I noticed y'all were restoring the, the stained glasses. I heard a little a little bit about that. What what exactly happened there? Uh, in fact, this church built in 1872 mm. was remodeled in the 60s, mm-hmm. and uh, the stained glass windows were changed yeah. uh, with a non-figurative uh, art. <laughs> uh, <gotcha>. yeah. <laughs> so we we try to bring Saint Stanislaus sure. back to its original beauty. Right. It is why uh, we have. Um, we, are, we have almost done now the campaign for the stained glass windows, but we had to change uh, 12 big stained glass mm-hmm. windows and uh, the big rows above the, mm-hmm. the organ of the church. But you know, stained glass windows, uh, it's, stained glass windows are mysterious because yes. they bring a special atmosphere in a church. Uh-huh. But I can say that for a priest in the 21st century, uh-huh. it's unique to be involved in uh, stained glass windows because you know when I was a child for me stained glass windows were the speciality of people sure. of the middle age 
Yeah. But I didn't think that it was possible, that it would be possible in my priestly life uh -huh. to be almost a priest of the Middle Age, uh -huh. working <laughs> with a specialist of glass and colors yeah. and yeah. also. Yeah. I can't felt... believe it. Could you maybe tell me about yourself? How did you end up becoming a priest? I thought it was interesting how Canon said uh, 12, because more or less in the United States, that corresponds to seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And somebody once told me, um, especially when it is that you're trying to understand what God is calling you to in order to get you to heaven, sometimes he places the idea of a, of a priestly or religious vocation <coughs> on the sevens. That mm -hmm. is to say seven years old, seventh grade, or 17. Mm -hmm. And so before these big changes in your life, obviously, you know, the age of reason, um, right before you're going to make your first Holy Communion, mm -hmm. uh, before you're going to go off to high school, before you're going to go off to college. And for me, it was more, uh, you know, God made sure that I knew uh, at the first seven because he knew that I was yeah. going to be too stubborn to pick it up on the second. Yeah. <laughs> so um, at seven years old, my uncle was a priest and I had looked up to him really mm -hmm. since I'd been two. I play mass when I was a little boy and um, I just I really looked up to him. And sure. by the time I got to be seven years old, he was the one who farmed me for my first confession, Doc, and I'm gonna my, plug first, this in. Uh, my first confession, my first um, Holy Communion. And um, that experience really did open my heart to the idea of a, pre a priestly vocation. Um, you can see why God decided to pick the first seven, because by the time I got to the second seven at seventh grade, I was thinking about all sorts of different things. And um, I was asked to come to help Canon Jair specifically on the weekends. Uh, I was asked to help our provincial superior in at our headquarters in Chicago with several projects. Mm -hmm. um, but here I have the wonderful joy of being here on the weekends where I'm able to truly um, see what it means to be a pastor of souls sure he's a, he's a horse for race is that right okay <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Well, what, what brought you to the more traditional orders in the latin mass with, <clears throat> as opposed to the novus ordo well i think it's important to think of two things one is of course the personal experience but then also is the you might say the objective reality sure Personal experiences that my uncle, as a priest, uh, he certainly always demonstrated a certain priestly dignity, mm -hmm. a certain priestly um, humility, and uh, in Latin you might say gravity or gravitas right. at the altar, and that was really what I noticed even as a child before I even you know was probably old enough to even recognize it, mm -hmm. and with that sort of demeanor, it just kind of gave me the dispositions. Um, as I grew, as I grew older, and I experienced other things that were, you might say, less beautiful, less uh, dignified, less humble. Um, I, uh, uh, I guess that was always kind of in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. And beauty converts. Sure. Beauty touches the soul in a way that we can't. And ugliness repels. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Amen. <laughs> yes, exactly. And when it is that you're 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 confronted with the something not only beautiful but sacred mm. um it it touches your soul in a way that you just kind of go with it and when i saw when i was introduced to the institute of christ the king i saw the beauty of the catholic faith expressed in all of its components mm -hmm. and it was almost as it just grabbed my heart and said you follow me <laughs> indeed awesome so. and you father what would draw drew you to the um, tridentine mass more oh than I, I, I remember my first traditional Latin mass in France. Uh -huh. uh, they still have those in France. <laughs> 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 yes, fortunately. All right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, it was for Christmas. Uh -huh. I remember it was my, I was 15 years old uh -huh. and uh, I attended my first Latin mass. It was a shock. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with this uh, particular impression that you get something you don't know what it is, but you you understand that it is what you are looking for. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a exactly. special sure. impression. Sure. And it was for Christmas. It was a midnight mass. I was 15 and I thought, oh, if the good Lord wants me to be his priest, mm -hmm. I would like to do that. Sure. Yeah. I don't know what yeah. it is, but <laughs> yeah, something happens. Right. <laughs> you didn't and understand it, but it, 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 just it was so different it. than uh, our Right. regular mass sure. in, in our parish. So, wow, this is wonderful. Yeah. And um, so it was a, like a, 
a revelation, you know, if you draw the veil mm -hmm. or, or the curtain and suddenly you see the light of the day. Wow, that's great. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a sun. Sure. So this was my very first experience of the traditional Latin mass. And um, I, for me, the most, um, the most marking was uh, transcendence. Mm -hmm. oh, this is not a show. Right. Uh, uh, the priest facing the tabernacle, uh, facing the east, uh, the congregation like, you know, the mm -hmm. flock following the shepherd. Mm -hmm. uh, all that was uh, um, brought a, a deep impression right. in my soul. And um, uh, step by step, I I understood that it was difficult to go back. Yeah, absolutely. To the, yeah. Our priest, uh, the the priest of our parish was a very he was very sincere, but he was a priest of the sixties. So he right. was a worker yeah. priest. He yeah. was unionist. He was very involved in uh, politics right. and um, uh, and I remember he told us now we must pray for peace. It was the era peace in Vietnam, and we didn't know with my yeah. my brother what was Vietnam. So we asked our father, "What, what is Vietnam?" <laughs> and uh, and uh, so the answer we got was uh, uh, the answer given by my father: "This priest is silly." And <laughs> right, right. and my mother said, "Oh dear, you cannot say that. He's a priest. <laughs> yes, yes, he's silly." <laughs> he said something different, but translated uh, <laughs> in, in English. So, but it was a meaning. So. Uh, so, so I think that in it was um, uh, an unforgettable um, uh, experience and yeah. unforgettable meeting a step sure. in my spiritual life. And uh, afterward, it was obvious for me, mm. Latin mass or nothing else. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, just from my experience, just seeing the Latin mass, it's, as you know, the much more transcendent it elevates the mind heavenward mm. rather than basely things and you do definitely get that from the Tridentine team mass uh more than others at least in my experience as well eric i know you have some questions let me let you jump in here i don't want to hog them all <laughs> yeah yeah no that's okay yeah. um so if you could briefly explain uh to us and our viewers how the institute of christ the king got started and what it is its mission yes uh you're it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you will also say you know, that uh, it's good to, uh, to be complimentary. Um, in fact, the Institute of Christ the King um, started um, progressively uh, in the late 80s of the last millennium, mm. a long time ago. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, and our superior, Monsignor Bach, I don't think that he received a special revelation from heaven. Mm -hmm. You have to do that, you know, with a mm -hmm. ray of light falling on him. He doesn't um, have this kind of... Um, but I think that he responded to a necessity to help some vocations for the priestly life mm -hmm. in a time of trouble for the church, the late 80s. And uh, he started to help some young men because he was working in Rome. So he had the possibility to help some uh, uh, young vocations. And um, step by step, very progressively, uh, this was the, the beginning of the Institute. Um, but at the very origin of the Institute, he didn't plan to be a founder. Or, um, no, at the very beginning, he thought, oh, I will help a group of young men. Uh, we were six uh, for the first year, and that will be fine. Yeah. And the second year, we were 10, and the third year, we were 20. So slowly, he understood that, in fact, he was, was on, he, was, he was on a special way that he didn't plan. <laughs> Right. And I think, I think it's a good sign for a community um, because uh, uh, it was without, um, it was not a big show. Mm -hmm. uh, he did, the, the, the plan was not, you know, to build a kind of stage. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, it's a humble uh, mm -hmm. community of priests uh, who uh, um, desire to uh, serve the church 
for the salvation of the souls. Right. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things that um, has, I would say, is the impetus for things like this is that after uh, the Second Vatican Council, there has been in the church in various places all over the all over the world, a, a tendency to kind of uh, lose the sense of the faith again. And would you say that the Institute of Christ the King has as it, at its mission a recovery uh, what we call, since uh, you know, Father Joseph Ratzinger, now Pope Emeritus Benedict the Sixteenth, the continuity, of, uh, the hermeneutic of continuity with the, with the tradition. What does the Institute of Christ the King offer in its mission that's recapturing, recovering, and restoring the the Catholic faith? Now it's your turn. Yeah, you're, you're, <laughs> you're in the hot seat. <laughs> Let's start with just a really simple concept that really kind of is the, you might say, the, the platform from which we'll, we can answer all of those questions. Mm -hmm. Monsignor Vaca, our founder and current prior general, says something very clear to us as seminarians. He says, you do not save the church. The church saves you. Mm -hmm. And with that simplicity, it really does, um, especially as a young, as Monsignor Vak puts it, a Zorro priest, <laughs> you know, somebody who he's, he's all full of zeal and energy yeah. and apostolic uh, drive, and he wants to do great things. But you realize that the church saves us. And it's through the grace that our Lord gives to her and through the sacraments and through the ordinary means of salvation that we are able to receive what she has to give to us. And so, as Karen said, it's about being a humble servant of the church, of Christ's mystical body, his spotless bride, and to be faithful to her, um, even in the midst of, you might say, her uh, her persecutions, her passion. Um, and that really goes to the heart of what it is that keeps us together. It's fidelity to the church. Um, and so it's not so much this kind of crusade that we just kind of take up in hand and you know decide we're going to, you know, do this, that, and everything else. It's through that fidelity by hanging on to to Christ and His Church and just being there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, um, you know, in the in the craziness of everything, you're just looking for a, a point of attachment, an anchor point. It's the cross. It's the cross where the church was founded, where the church, you might say, was conceived in a certain sense, um, where the blood and water poured out uh, from our Lord's heart. Um, and onto the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. John, the first priest, and of course, you know, our, the mother of all priests. And it's there that we, we, hold, we hold fast. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, it's amazing what blessings come from that. So mm -hmm. it's not so much beforehand, we want to do this, that, and everything else, is that we want to be faithful to the church. We want to be faithful to the one true faith. We want to be faithful to its, uh, its teachings at the, as they've been perennially handed down. Um, for centuries under, you know, with the help of our patron saints as kind of our models and our guide, um, certainly under the protection of the Immaculate Conception, but St. Benedict, the, you might say the father of, of Western Christianity or Western, mm -hmm. I should say, like kind of uh, Western monasticism, yeah, yeah, Christian mm -hmm. civilization, right. um, St. Thomas Aquinas. And it's kind of neat how you see how one generation of our patron saints hands it on to the next generation. So St. Thomas Aquinas with the, you know, the angelic doctor and universal doctor of the church, just the pure faith, the yeah. way that it's expressed and it's, it's in its simplicity and in its beauty. And then uh, St. Francis de Sales with the charity in to order to teach that faith to, you might say, a rebellious time, mm. um, considering where, you know, he is in the history of, of the church. And then uh, we always, um, we always end with uh, St. Therese of the little flower or St. Therese of the child Jesus. Mm. And she really does bring us right back around to the, the, um, the real center of our priestly lives um, is that we are priests for Christ the King. And there's no more beautiful of an expression of his um, omnipotent uh, presence and how his omnipotent, um, uh, you might say, royalty than as a child the infant king the infant jesus and in our seminary even we have in the in the niche we have the uh, the infant king there uh, and that's where we pray every single day 
to make our hearts like his. That was his priestly heart. That's simple, pure, innocent, humble. All these things we learn from the infant Jesus, and we learn them from the time that we're in seminary, and we try to take them and carry them into our priestly uh, life, wherever it is that God may be calling us. Mm. So one yeah. of the things my friend, I, I tried to explain, I gave him the elevator speech one time when I was still in seminary, and he just looked at me and said, so the priests of the Institute, you guys are just really good at doing what you're supposed to do. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, that's one way of putting it. It's like really good at doing ordinary things. That is to say, like for St. Francis de Sales, you know, just be good, be excellent at what you are. And that's what we try to do every single day is just be good at what we are and be faithful. That, um, you know, it's such a great answer. Um, I appreciate that because, you know, a lot of what we're supposed to be in the Catholic Church is calibrated towards becoming a child because the Lord said, unless you are like a child, yeah. you won't enter the kingdom. And often we get these um, impulses to, like you said, go on a crusade. Um, and in many cases today, we see uh, people with so much anxiety going into schism, leaving the Catholic Church or or being so outspoken as to put stains on, on the mystical body of Christ. And we learn that God's wisdom, like you just shared, is it catches us off guard. You know, the, the wisdom of God catches us off guard, just like it did St. Paul, where, you know, in many cases, or the apostles, they they <clears throat> wanted that, you know, Peter had him, oh, no, we're going to go to Jerusalem, we're going to take over, right? Christ, Christ's wisdom, it caught him off guard. And St. Paul, when he was going through his missionary journeys, he thought, why do I have this thorn in my side? This, <laughs> this is a hindrance to me. I should be able to be a missionary. And Christ came and said, no, this is meant to be. This is meant to be. Yeah. And, and the idea is my grace, Christ telling St. Paul, my grace is sufficient. And that's that whole childlike orientation. Yeah. So I appreciate that answer. The, the next question I would have is uh, what would people expect to see? in an institute of christ the king parish that you wouldn't see in perhaps um a, a you know an average parish that many americans would see today you know what what you know what would we see i would say to reply to your question first of all an apostolate of the institute of christ the king doesn't work to be better than the other parishes or churches in the world. Look at us, we are the best. Right, right, right. <laughs> we are specialists of humility. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to me. No. <laughs> I think that what is given, so because you know, we live in an atmosphere of competition, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, I want. If you have the mind of a, of a winner, say, oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to do that, and mm -hmm. I will show them that. Uh, I think that uh, the uh, not only us, but every priest in the Catholic Church works for the kingdom of God and doesn't compete with uh, something different. I would say that what is given in a church of the Institute of Christ the King is what is usually, traditionally, given by the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So we have invented nothing. Mm -hmm. We are not very brilliant or bright. <laughs> we give what has always been given by uh, our mother, the Church. And But it's true that in uh, a, a time of postmodernity, people are spiritually lonely and they are like sheep without shepherd. Yeah, mm -hmm. So it's very important that in uh, a parish, in a church, in an apostolate of the Institute, people are like uh, a boat in a harbor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's impossible to, to, to become a saint if you are alone on an island, mm -hmm. unless you have a special vocation, but it's very rare. So we need a community. Yeah. Uh, so and in this time uh, of um, uh, trouble for the world and for the church, um, a parish is like uh, a shelter. People are very attached to their church. Uh, they love it, and they desire to receive 
what the church teaches, not mm -hmm. my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. They don't need to, uh, they need to get what, they need to feed their soul to reply to, the, to their questions mm -hmm. and also uh, to feed uh, the faith of their family and um, and they need the sacrament. Mm. And also, it's true that uh, I, I tell them often, uh, there is a life after mass. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> like there is a life after life, <laughs> there is a life after mass. So the community life is very important. So we work also uh, to um, build in between uh, our parishioners a spirit of spiritual help you know mm -hmm. when families are connected they help each other uh, are you sick oh i can visit you maybe i can do all that is also the life mm -hmm. of uh, a, a community of faith and i think that this is what people need nowadays sure. a harbor we are close by lake michigan <laughs> right. so imagine that the soul is like a, a boat and um, sometimes the lake is uh, icy or right. there is a big storm mm -hmm. so it's important to have a spiritual harbor where you can anchor your soul reload your batteries and uh, mm -hmm. go again for another voyage so this is I would say this is the role of uh, an apostolate of the Institute uh, to be um, uh, a beacon of stability mm -hmm. and of Catholic faith yeah. uh, because it is what is needed nowadays. Father, let me follow up on something that you're saying there, the need for a community, a strong mm -hmm. family, you know, parish. Um, what would you say to those Catholics who are just in an area where there just really isn't a good parish? What, what, what can they do to continue to grow in sanctity? I would say that nowadays it is difficult to be parish homeless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I see sometimes some uh, especially young people or when they marry they become more stable but they have the tendency you know to to move uh, <laughs> yeah I, I tell them since this house is not a jail you are not compelled <laughs> to stay here but you you should choose mm -hmm. your your church because you know you see that also in the acts of the apostles mm -hmm. the early church was a, a community and afterward a community of communities and this is the universal catholic church mm -hmm. but people uh, we are the religion of the incarnation uh, we do not <laughs> live in the spirit mm -hmm. we live in reality mm -hmm. so i would tell that uh, find a, a place a church where you get what your life of faith mm -hmm. needs sacraments and orthodox teaching mm -hmm. and also support because the priest is not an administrator right the priest is a shepherd sure mm -hmm. and i think that this is a real need nowadays absolutely i would definitely agree ken and weaver let me ask you a question what would you say about somebody who says you know i love the latin mass as far as the beauty the transcendence the singing all of that but it's in Latin, and I don't speak Latin. I don't understand any of this. Why Latin? What, what would you say to somebody like that? You make me laugh. There was a, um, <laughs> you probably had that before. <laughs> well, I've heard other people answer that question. Okay. And uh, one of the priests that I can think of, he he would answer, "Well, I'm not talking to you." Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I mean, and I laugh about it because it's yeah. kind of funny, but true. Um, it is. It really is an interesting question, and mm -hmm. sometimes it, ha it has to do with uh, how we actually ask the question. Mm -hmm. In French, don't you say that there's a, a question um, well asked is one that's already half answered? Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, because from a syllogism standpoint, yeah. it's like, well, the Latin mass, you see what I mean? And yeah. uh, therefore, I don't speak Latin, therefore, right. I don't like the Latin mass. Right. You, you see how it yeah. kind of, you, yeah. it's like, you already, you already set us up. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, one of the things that's interesting is to consider that, like Cannon was saying, we just try to do what the church has always done. Mm -hmm. Not too long ago, this wasn't called the Latin Mass. Yeah. 
This was just the holy the sacrifice of the mass. Yeah. The one unbloody sacrifice of the mass. Um, and period. Sure. So how if someone were to ask me that question, um, I don't know if I'd, I'd say well, I wasn't talking to you, but <laughs> at the same time to try to help people understand that it's precisely because we're not speaking yeah. to uh, to the faithful at that at those moments. And even when we are that all of that helps to make us understand the Catholicity of the one true faith the universality of it. And so the people who do not have um, necessarily a parish nearby, maybe they live in the middle of, you know, where there isn't a parish of the Institute of Christ the King or someplace else where they can go to receive not, I mean, certainly the sacraments, of course, you hope that, you know, that they have that, but then maybe uh, not only Orthodox teaching, but the truth taught in charity, mm -hmm. that warmth of charity that makes it understood by the person who's receiving the teaching, mm -hmm. that the person who's teaching loves them, loves them enough to actually care about them knowing the truth and to do it in a way, the Latin phrase uh, for philosophy, um, whatever is received is received according to the mode of the receiver. Mm -hmm. And so really being conscientious of how it is that someone is disposed to receiving this truth yeah. in order that they might receive it purely. Sure. And, um, and you know, your question reminds me uh, the story of a priest, maybe in the 50s, uh -huh. and uh, he was a nice priest, but he complained and he said to his bishop, oh, this Latin for me, it's and the bishop told him, don't worry, God, you don't understand? God, God understands. <laughs> yeah, he does. Yeah. And, and I'm like, you know, I, 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 I join you to say that Latin is a sign of unity. Um, also, uh, an old uh, language mm -hmm. that is not used in the Good common point. life, yep. in the daily life, with st uh, w w some words in English or in French has have changed their meaning mm -hmm. in the last um, 30, 40 years. So the stability of an old language mm -hmm. is also very appropriate to explain, to express truths mm -hmm. that are eternal. Mm -hmm. The sense, the, the meaning of the word doesn't change. And also the fact that in church, the Latin language is used, introduced immediately people in another world, the world of the sacred. True. Yeah. Even in the time of Jesus, the devout Jews in the synagogues or in the temple of Jerusalem, they didn't use the ordinary language that yes. they used in their kitchen or in the street. Mm -hmm. They used a classic Hebrew. It is why when Jesus is on the cross and he says, quoting the Holy Scripture, Eloi, Eloi, Yabba Sabachthani, mm. he speaks an, mm. a classic Hebrew mm -hmm. that the Jews at the foot of his cross mm -hmm. do not understand. Right. Because mm. for prayer and for the liturgy, mm -hmm. the Jews used another language. Right. And in the world, even nowadays, many religions of the world use another language. Sure. If you go in the mosque, it's not the, the daily Arabic that is right. used in the mosque. Why? Because men have this concept that to talk with God, oh, he's not, he's not someone ordinary. Mm. So we have to use another, other words. Mm. They sing and they use a, a language that is progressively reserved mm -hmm. to a sacred use and this is great yeah mm -hmm. and here i see that the youth is very receptive to that yes they, they yeah. don't speak latin so right. what right. Uh, in europe it's easier in europe to explain that to the young people because they listen a lot of american music oh yeah mm -hmm. sure and you can tell them so do you understand english <laughs> and i know right. so, uh, right. so uh, <laughs> doesn't matter because they love yeah. it yeah. and sometimes they know by heart yeah words that they do not understand Mm -hmm. Because it's important to, to, to remember that the mystery that we celebrate in the liturgy mm -hmm. is not against the reason, but beyond the human reason. Yeah. And um, with 
all the translations in uh, vernacular language, mm -hmm. we have lost the sense yeah. of transcendence, verticality, sacred. You know, it's a it will be a long process for the next generation to learn again mm -hmm. to be silent in church. Mm -hmm. That church is not a meeting room where people chat, hey, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. We can do that after mm -hmm. mass, sure. but not in church. Mm -hmm. And it will be a long process for our uh, modern wounded yeah. mind to relearn that. Yeah. And the Latin language and the other uh, languages of the, of the traditional liturgies of the church are very like Greek or Hebrew, uh, Aramaic languages, are very helpful for that. Mm -hmm. You know, for us priests celebrating the liturgy in Latin, we do not have the temptation to bring a personal comment. Right. That's true. Oh, no, no, no. No. Yeah. There is no room for that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very helpful for the priest himself and also for the faithful yeah. to understand that when we celebrate the liturgy, we have at least one foot in eternity mm -hmm. and it's 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 wonderful fathers i, I like that both of y'all mentioned in, in response to the question about latin that this is a conversation primarily with god i mean there are parts of the liturgy that are oriented towards the congregation but the vast majority of it is speaking and communicating with god and in fact a lot of people might be confused by the fact that you're back is facing the people, but that actually isn't the case. It's also that the orientation that you as a priest have during the liturgy, it's facing God in the East, the Orient, because that's of course where Christ is gonna return from the East. So you are facing and leading the people as a shepherd to Christ. So I, I like the fact that y'all noted that this is primarily our orientation to God. You see that with the language, the orientation and the positions, everything. Um, one other thing you noted also though, you mentioned young people being attracted to the more traditional liturgy. Yeah. Could you maybe speak to that a little bit? Because I think that might be news for some people. <laughs> um, has it really been your experience that a lot of younger folks yes, are I, interested in? I remember a bishop from Belgium, he said, uh, uh, the traditional Latin mass is in fact the new mass mm. because it is, it, <laughs> right. it is the mass yeah. of the youth. <laughs> right. You know, when I attend an ordinary, uh, a mass according to the, the ordinary form, I said, oh, it reminds me of my childhood. Mm. So for me, it's huh. a yeah. bit a mass of right. <laughs> yeah. my background. So it's true that there is, that the young generation is thirsty of sacred beauty. Yeah. And if they do not get it in the Catholic Church, they will get it with a guru, sure. right. with some herbs, right. or <laughs> superstitions, <laughs> I don't know what, but it's important to be aware yeah. of that. Yeah. And it's visible among <laughs> the young generation and also the young generation of priests. Mm -hmm. They are seeking that. Yeah, Be because I think that we, we didn't go through the hippie era. Mm. So mm. Right. <laughs> it's just not something, mm. you know, we're, we're not really attracted to that. Uh, we come from a different generation. So we, we want something that is beautiful and transcendent. We don't want something that is common and mundane. We can get that at home. Yes. So, yes, yeah. open, switch uh, your TV uh, right. on and you will have right. a show. Yeah. And, and the, the TV guy, mm does that much better than the local Much priest. better, much <laughs> better, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Might as well stay at home in that case. Eric, I know you have another uh, few questions. Let me let you jump in. It, yeah, did you want to, can we, did you want to say something about the ad orientum direction of the, 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 the priest? I'm not sure, I, th I thought you said you wanted to say something on that. Um, well, maybe quite simply, how safe would you feel if when you were in a bus, mm -hmm. your driver was facing you? <laughs> <laughs> right yeah <laughs> right and that's the appropriate perspective it's just that people are looking at it from the wrong perspective they're thinking that the liturgy is about them when it's actually the sacrifice oriented towards god and when it is that we kind of you know try to um see things the way that you might say our ancestors would have seen things without maybe the polemics that you can some can, mm -hmm. can sometimes come up um 
there is that constant conversation and you see really the the priest as mediator between mm -hmm. god mm -hmm. and then man and that there is this constant turning yeah. between god in the tabernacle mm -hmm. and there on the on the altar and to bring god in the most blessed sacrament to then to the communion rail where the cloth is then laid out and prepared before mm -hmm. uh before them and they come in like children like you can imagine snowflakes uh landing upon your tongue just you know and mm -hmm. there the priest puts god in the mouth of a child and this humility is in is precisely what it is that will bring back all of those things um that will take you know that will take time to reestablish, but the the knowledge that we don't save the church, the knowledge that um, or the, the the conviction that we are um, humble servants uh, of Holy Mother Church and our Lord our Lord Jesus Christ and what He wishes to do, and then the perseverance to just continue faithfully and patiently in doing what it is that we need to do, and when it is that we have that humility also to accept what it is that the church wishes to give to us, including the Latin language. That humility then allows us the opportunity to see how beautiful everything is. Mm -hmm. So instead of calling it into question first, it's like, why this? It's like, well, this is what this is what we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then after that, it's like, wow, this is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's all. Well, so, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say the the last question that um, that I was going to ask is that we a lot of our viewers uh, are Catholics who are out there and don't necessarily have access to a parish, you know, that is, you know, gives Orthodox teaching and that, you know, there is even a question on some of the sacraments. Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of uh, a lot of our viewers look at us as a resource and our message box will be loaded with questions like, what do I do? What do I do? What would you say, you know, given that we are going through what we are going through, um, what for the average Catholic, should they do to navigate through these waters? Whether it's a book you can recommend, a small word of advice, or anything like that. You go first. I start. You, you 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 continue. I would <laughs> okay. say I would say first of us, first of all, in this world, many people of faith, um, you know, they they face the big crisis in the world and unfortunately even in the church i would say in a time of storm hold the wheel mm -hmm. don't panic mm -hmm. do not be afraid by the bad informations or bad news or sad news you receive don't be afraid hold the wheel don't leave the boat uh, be stable until the end of the storm. Um, they receive also a lot of informations. And sometimes informations break the inner peace of the soul. All the news and everything. Oh, it's too much, it's too many. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's important to receive that, but with a distance, not a distance of coldness, but a distance of objectivity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say to the people who do not have uh, uh, what they need, call Canon. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Throw it on the <laughs> He's a bus <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's a provincial. He's a secretary of the provincial. <laughs> no, but it's nice, you know, because in many uh, locations of the world, um, parishes with the Latin Mass started with a group of determined faithful mm -hmm. who uh, contact our, our provincial headquarters, uh, who uh, contact their local bishop and said, hey, we are a group. Uh, there is a possibility in the Catholic Church to have the traditional Latin Mass. We want that for us. Yeah. It's difficult. It's a long process. It's an act of courage. But it's vital mm -hmm. for, fam for many families. And um, I would say, don't fear and uh, start. 
Excellent, Ken. Now my, now my mailbox will be just <laughs> right. <laughs> but no, people okay. need to know to know. Uh, uh, so who uh, could uh, I contact now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, to that point, it rem remembering um, that the phrase is uh, outside of the church, there is no salvation. Mm -hmm not outside of the Institute of Christ the King, there's mm, no salvation. Sure, sure. So when it is that um, you might not have uh, what it is that you really seek, remember that the faith, the religion of the incarnation is not a faith in a book. Mm -hmm. It's a faith in a person, a divine person, Jesus Christ. And by holding fast to that, um, and that is what it is that he is testing us all in his mystical body right now. Mm. Um, if our Lord Jesus Christ as head of the church went through what he went through during his passion, mm. um, we shouldn't expect anything else mm -hmm. as the members of his mystical body, the church. So hang on tight. Mm. I can only repeat what Canon just said. And, um, know that it is precisely in the childlike humility to ask God for what it is that we need for salvation, that he answers our prayers. Look at when it is that our Lord decided to enter into history um, in, uh, you may say, the, the, the height of the Roman Empire. Um, and the little ones were the ones that were asking for that grace necessary in order to receive what was promised to them. Um, we can't, of course, be everywhere all at once, mm -hmm. um, but we can certainly uh, unite in prayer. That is to say, through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the charity that binds us, the perfection, mm -hmm. the, that, bond, that, um, that link of perfection, which holds us together. That is really what is going to get us through. Uh, these times in order that when it is that the storm is over and the storm will have much to will have much to repair mm -hmm. but we'll be in good hearts we'll be in good spirits and we'll have each other in order to do what needs to get done one day at a time with the supernatural confidence in our lord jesus christ what he said that i am with you always mm -hmm. Father, I like that you mentioned that we have to really hold on tight right now to the ship. It reminds me of Odysseus when in the Odyssey when he's navigating between Scylla and Charybdis and, you know, two monsters <laughs> flanked on both sides and he's trying to make it through the little narrow strait, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and he barely made it by the skin of his teeth holding on tight to the ship. Kind of reminds me of what we're going through right now in the church. But as you noted, what happens to the head of the church also happens down to the, his, the, the rest of the body, the mystical body. And so just as Christ went through a crucifixion and the body is going through a cru crucifixion, Christ was also resurrected. And so too, the body will be resurrected. So there is a happy ending. There is hope. There is good that is going to come. So I appreciate both of y'all mentioning that. I also want to thank you both for your priesthood. I really do. Y'all are both functioning in the you're talking about the person of Christ. Y'all are functioning in persona Christi. Y'all are the face of Christ for the people around you. And I know you had to make a lot of sacrifices for that vocation. It's the highest calling. So thank you very much for making those sacrifices. And thank you for, thank you. for being a gentleman of faith. Yeah, thank yes. you. Thank you. Yeah, it was great having you on. Any concluding uh, comments any, any of y'all wanted to make? I, I, I learned a lot. Thank you guys so much. It was, it was really great. Thank you, fathers. Yeah, I said what you already know, but I said it with a French accent. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's all that matters. <laughs> well, fathers, can we get your blessing and everyone in the audience can also Yes, with joy. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Descendat Super Vos et Maniat Semper. Amen. 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 And come back to St. Stanislaus. Yes. Yes. Thank you.